Hello again, this is the second part of my exploration of the reign of Egypt's first ever pharaoh, Narmer. Our discussion of Narmer is itself part of a larger series in which I plan on delving into the reigns of every single ancient Egyptian pharaoh in their own videos. Today, we'll be looking into Narmer's mysterious family, the surprising number of large-scale monuments from his reign that have survived into the present day, and his tomb complex. But remember, please like and subscribe if you find stuff like this interesting, so you can stay tuned for more just like it. It also really helps the channel grow. But without further ado, let's begin. Narmer's wife is thought to be a woman named Neith Hotep, who may be the first non-mythical woman known by name to history. As I mentioned in the last video, Neith Hotep is thought to have possibly been a member of the old ruling family of the city of Nupt, since a monumental mastaba or bench tomb found near it in 1897 has been attributed to her. Given that the latest pharaoh's name to be discovered in it belonged to Aha, the successor of Narmer, Neith Hotep was thought to have passed away during Aha's reign. I say was because as recently as 2012, a groundbreaking archaeological discovery completely changed our understanding of this queen's life. Rock inscriptions found in the Wadi Ameira in the Sinai by Pierre Talley indicate that Nithotep may have actually acted as regent for Egypt's third ever pharaoh, Jer, since their names were found right next to each other. This suggests they jointly sent a mining expedition into the Sinai, who then carved these pictures. This regency might also explain a gap between Aha and Jer's reign on the Old Kingdom royal annal known as the Palermo Stone, which might reference an interregnum that lasted either one month and 15 days, or 13 months and 20 days. Nithotep's name was also discovered written within a strange serech, topped by the emblem sign of the goddess Neith. This may have something to do with with her being a queen regent, since this same type of Sarek was also employed by a later First Dynasty queen regent named Merneith, but this would assume that she was somehow queen regent while Aha was still alive, since this variant of her name was found within the Nakata Mastaba. It's also possible that this name was given to her for specific political and religious reasons, aimed at appealing to Buto and Sais, Neith's nice cult centers, which had recently been conquered by Narmer. Neithotep may have also been a priestess in Neith's cult. Anyways, since Narmer's reign is thought to have been up to 60 years long, and his successor Aha's reign is thought to have been nearly 30 years long, this discovery casts doubt on the notion that she was actually Narmer's wife, which is already pretty much just a guess. Neithotep would have to be pretty old by the time she became Jer's regent, assuming she was Narmer's wife and Jer's grandmother, but this doesn't completely eliminate the possibility of her being that. But still, Neithotep is arguably more likely to have been Aha's wife and possibly Narmer's daughter instead. Keep in mind, ancient Egyptian royals did not shy away from incest, and Aha may have married his sister. Other evidence for the theory that Neithotep was Aha's wife is the fact that an object bearing Neithotep's name was found in Jer's tomb in the Umel Kab at Abydos. But this could have happened because in the millennia of pillaging this cemetery has undergone, this object strayed from the tomb of Aha and somehow wound up in the tomb of Jer. But in addition, Neithotep's name has been found written behind Aha's, an honor allotted to the king's mother and wife. So I guess that isn't that conclusive. Also, as you've probably guessed by now, it's likely that Neithotep wasn't actually the one buried in the Nakata Mastaba, since if she was buried in the Nakata Mastaba during Aha's reign, she of course couldn't have been Jer's regent. Instead, it was probably built for a guy named Reket, which brings us to the other members of Narmer's family, his sons. A total of 15 instances of Reket's name were found in the Nakata Mastaba, making him the most frequently named person in it besides Pharaoh Aha, who we know was buried elsewhere, so it couldn't have belonged to him. Reket's name was found on ceilings in various vessels, sometimes with Aha's name, in the tomb's innermost chambers. 
Ten instances of Neithotep's name were found in total at the site, but in different contexts. Reket's name was also found within Aha's tomb in the Umm al Kab, and that's what I'm showing you now. Although Reket could have been either Narmer's or Aha's son, it's more likely that he was Narmer's since he likely held high office during Aha's reign, especially since the highest government posts were reserved for members of the royal family at the time. Another name, likely belonging to another king's son, was also found in the tomb that of Het. This Het may have been another son of Narmer, and we might know where he was buried too, a monumental mastaba in North Saqqara, overlooking the site of Memphis, and it's similar to the one at Nakata. For example, they both employ the royal palace facade niching. The Saqqara tomb, known as S3357, is the earliest monumental tomb thus far found around Memphis, making it the first of many, many more that were to come. It's not actually certain that it was Hetz, given that the owner's name wasn't found within it, but it was probably his. Given the tomb's location, Het, or whichever member of Normer's family occupying it, was probably based at Memphis as a high official. Reket was probably based at Kus, a town that was slightly closer to his tomb than Nupt, and if that was the case, then he probably had a hand in managing the gold coming out of the nearby Wadi Hamamat. These princes were probably installed in their offices by their father Narmer. As a result, they would have acted as proxies for the king at strategic locations around Egypt. Handy, given that even though the king probably toured Egypt pretty often, he couldn't be everywhere at once. With Het based at Memphis, the city's role as an administrative center had definitely begun. As discussed in the last video, both the person labeled as Titi and the sandal bearer depicted on the Narmer palette could have been Narmer's sons. It's been theorized that the person labeled as Titi may have been Egypt's first vizier, too, as the later word for vizier was Chati, which is sort of similar, right? Additionally, the pictorial the sandal bearer is shown wearing on the Narmer palette may indicate that he acted as the king's seal bearer, given that the pictorial sort of looks like a cylinder seal. But then again, those two theories are pretty conjectural. Yet another person was mentioned on the objects from the Nakata tomb, one Mary Idi. It's possible that this refers to a young Jer, given that his personal name was Idi, but it's also very possible that it refers to Reckett's wife. So now that we're pretty much done talking about Narmer's known immediate family, let's move on to the fascinating monuments he had created, like any good pharaoh. What makes them all the more remarkable is that, despite how enormous some of them are, they've miraculously endured for 5,000 years to the modern day. To begin with, Narmer likely commissioned this roughly 20-inch tall alabaster baboon statue, because his serac is incised into the front of its base. The cubic style it's in is characteristic of the early dynastic period, and its empty eyes were probably once inlaid with something. It, along with another statue, possibly commissioned by Narmer, is one of the few large-scale stone animal statues and large-scale statues, period, from this time in Egypt's history. These early dynastic animal statues are assumed to have been cult images for the gods worshipped in such forms. This baboon is currently housed within the Egyptisches Museum in Berlin, but no one's sure exactly where it came from since it was bought on the art market in 1927. So in addition to surviving for thousands of years in Egypt, it also survived the fall of Berlin. It possibly represents a baboon deity known as Hedgeware, meaning the Great White One. This god was possibly the manifestation of royal ancestors, and this statue may have actually been intended as a representation of Narmer himself after he had died. As such, it may have come from a part of Narmer's mortuary complex at Abydos, which we'll soon talk about, his mysterious funerary enclosure. Another possible clue regarding its origin is this ram carved just to the left of Narmer Serek on the statue's base. Another hieroglyph is thought by some to have existed just below and to the right of the ram sign and together with the ram could have possibly formed the name Knum Hotep. Now this is pure conjecture but it's been proposed that this Knum Hotep was yet another son of Narmer. But just to show you how far-fetched this is, that other sign besides the ram might just have been veins in the stone. 
A five-inch tall alabaster frog statue in the Cleveland Museum of Arts is very similar in style to the Berlin baboon, so it's possible that the Cleveland frog was commissioned by Narmer too. Notably, the sculptor used the natural banding of the stone to emphasize how round the frog is, and it's a pretty round frog. It was probably a cult image of Heket, the Egyptian frog goddess of fertility and childbirth. Small faience frogs are common votive offerings from the early dynastic period. Like with the baboon, this frog statue's original location isn't actually known, as it was also bought on the art market. But it may have also come from Abydos, since the site of Abydos seems to have been linked to Heket's cult. But Narmer's most impressive remaining monuments are three fragmentary colossal statues known as the Koptos Colossi. They were discovered at the site of Koptos in Upper Egypt by Flinders Petrie back in the excavation season of 1893-4. Since then, two have wound up in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and one has ended up in the Cairo Museum. Koptos was the cult center of the fertility god Min, and they were found at the site of the main temple of Min at Koptos, so that's the god these are thought to represent. These statues have, unfortunately, been reduced to their nearly cylindrical torsos, parts of their legs, and one of their badly battered heads, but originally these statues would have stood a whopping 13 feet or 4 meters tall. That means they would have been 2.5 times life-size. Colossal statues from this early in Egypt's history are very, very rare, and these statues also have the honor of being some of the earliest surviving cult images of an anthropomorphic deity. But they depict something we'd consider rather strange for a depiction of a god. You see, that circle in the center of the statue represents its hand, and it encircles what would have been an attached phallus, complete with a still intact scrotum. So I think you can see where this is going. I know it's bizarre, but keep in mind that Min was a fertility god. Anyways, we know these were probably made during Narmer's reign, or that at the very least they were added to during his reign, because the sides of these statues bear low-relief decoration and graffiti referencing him. In 1987, close examination of the Cairo statue produced hitherto unnoticed graffiti. On the left side of the statue was an incised catfish. On the right side, in low relief, there was a serac with a curved top, a type of serac that supposedly wasn't produced after the reign of Aha. Unfortunately, the area above the serac flaked off, so we're not sure exactly who it belonged to. There was also a horizontal harpoon, which was also a symbol associated with royalty. Also on the Cairo statue, right next to a depiction of an elephant, there is something that could be reconstructed as the tail of a catfish, so part of Narmer's name, like with the other catfish on the statue. But I personally think this interpretation is a bit strenuous, as you can see. So it's not 100% certain that these were made during Narmer's reign, but I like to think that they were. Now let's move on to Narmer's strangely humble tomb within the Umel el Kab at Abydos. When you picture a pharaoh's tomb, you probably picture a pyramid, or the magnificently decorated rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Well, despite being a United Egypt's first ever pharaoh, Narmer's tomb isn't exactly huge. But a building connected to his mortuary cult situated nearby his so-called funerary enclosure certainly was. Narmer's tomb is made up of two twin mud brick lined pits called B17 and B18. It's in a part of the Umel Kab called Cemetery B and was built as part of the same sequence of tombs as his predecessors Ka and Iri Hor, as well as his successor Aha. B17 is a bit larger and a bit more well preserved than B18, but still only measures around 3 by 4.1 meters, while B18 is only around 3 by 3 meters. B18 collapsed in antiquity, but was rebuilt with bricks and in part with wooden panels. The mud bricks lining the tomb were once covered with mud mortar painted white, so there wasn't much decoration. There were also two holes in B17, which probably held posts which once supported a roof. It was first discovered in the 1890s by French Egyptologist Emile Amelineau, but he was a pretty shoddy archaeologist, unfortunately. The Umel Kab had been pillaged in antiquity, but let's just say he didn't help the situation much and wound up scattering a bunch of artifacts all over the place. 
As such, some of the objects originally sitting in Narmer's tomb wound up in the tombs of other pharaohs. Flinders Petrie, who was much more systematic in his excavation methods, named the tomb's chambers and found a load of stuff in it that Amilino had left behind. These include the fragments making up the three so-called Narmer boxes, a vital clue to Narmer's activities, which I mentioned in the last video, in addition to seal impressions bearing Narmer's serac and fine flint knives, which may have come from the tomb of Jer. But Petrie originally identified chamber B10, now thought to be a part of Aha's tomb, as belonging to Narmer instead. B-17 and B-18 were attributed to the family members of Menes, who Petrie considered different from Narmer. But a re-evaluation of the site conducted in the 1960s by Werner Kaiser and further excavations of it conducted in the 1970s by the German Archaeological Institute under him and Gunter Dreyer revealed that B-17 and 18 were actually Narmer's tomb, as we know now, based on scattered seal impressions and the like found within its vicinity, pointing to him being its owner. So what about that enclosure? Well, it was only discovered through a magnetometry survey in 2001, and was then excavated during the 2002-3 excavation season at Abydos. It's around one and a half kilometers north of the Umm el Kab, near the edge of the Nile floodplain, and sits near a bunch of other enclosures, all oriented southeast by northwest, belonging to other early dynastic pharaohs also buried in the Umm el Kab. Initially, initially, these enclosures would have been rather high and thick, but they probably didn't enclose much except a small chapel where offerings to the deceased king were deposited, and a small room behind one of the entrances. In this specific enclosure's case, the entrance room has been found, but the chapel hasn't been excavated because a Coptic cemetery lies over it. This may have been where the Berlin baboon originally came from. Like most of the other enclosures, it seems to have been deliberately raised to the ground, possibly so it could be sent into the afterlife with Normer. The enclosure has a much more creative name than B-17 and B-18, because it's called the Donkey Enclosure. Why? Well, to the southeast of this enclosure, three graves containing the skeletons of ten donkeys were discovered. Most of the other enclosures were surrounded by graves belonging to humans. But there's one problem with this. The donkey enclosure hasn't been conclusively identified as Normer's, because his name, or the name of any other king for that matter, hasn't actually been found within it yet. Hundreds of seal impressions and pieces of pottery were found within the enclosure's entrance chamber, and they have been dated to the early First Dynasty, though. Enclosures have been identified for other First Dynasty kings, like Aha and Jer, so... That's the reason this is thought to be Narmer's. The enclosures belonging to Aha are right next door to the northeast. The extra two may belong to some of the high-ranking members of the royal family we've already discussed. An argument against the donkey enclosure being Narmer's entails that since the donkey enclosure is larger than all three of Aha's enclosures put together, and conversely Aha's tomb in the Umm el Kab is much larger than Narmer's, the donkey enclosure can't have possibly belonged to Narmer. This is supported by the other enclosures, generally correlating to the size of the tombs of their owners. So, at the end of the day, it's very possible that the donkey enclosure is Narmer's greatest monument, but we can't say that for sure. Before we move on from Narmer and cover the reign of his son, Aha, we've got to look at a question that's boggled the minds of Egyptologists for a long time. Which one of them was Menes? You see, Menes is what later ancient Egyptians, starting in the mid-18th dynasty, as well as classical historians, called the legendary founder of Egypt. In the surviving excerpts of the 4th century BC Egyptian historian Menetho's now lost history of Egypt, a few details are given about his reign. According to the various people who copied down Manetho's work, he reigned for either 62 years or 30 years, was the first of the eight kings of Egypt's first dynasty, one renowned for conducting a military campaign beyond Egypt's borders, and was killed by a hippopotamus. Herodotus claims that Menes diverted the Nile in order to found Memphis. The question of Menes' true identity has been hotly debated by a lot of people way smarter than me for a long time, but I'm going to put forward the answer that I found most convincing. Narmer was Menes. 
A lot of the people who support the idea that Aha was Menes cite a little label found in the Nakata tomb as evidence of him being Menes, because it shows his name next to a little shrine containing a low rectangular sign subdivided into squares and topped with triangular and rounded protrusions. Now, you might think that's not so special, but this sign is read as Men, so some people think it might stand for the name Menes. The pro normer party have argued that the shrine it's in might be some sort of funerary shrine for Normer, but on a later label, this same sort of shrine is shown again, and there it's clearly not supposed to be a funerary shrine. But both arguments are a bit of a stretch, and so the Nakata label isn't conclusive evidence of anything, really. There are also seal impressions that show Normer's Sarek alternating with the exact same men sign. The pro-Normer camp, of course, believe that the men sign represents Normer's personal name, and that these seal impressions are clear evidence that Normer was Menes. But on the other hand, the Aha camp have put forward the idea that the men sign actually represents the name of a prince, because this seal is similar to other early First Dynasty seals thought to maybe bear the name of princes with their fathers. Ultimately, this seal is also pretty inconclusive evidence. Then there's the debate raging over who exactly established Memphis, since Herodotus said Menes did it. As I said in my last video, it's likely that Memphis was around before Normer's time, but Normer probably completed it and, as evidenced by the Saqqara Mastaba mentioned in this video, began to use it as an administrative center. The Aha camp has argued that since the Mastaba was built in Aha's reign, it suggests Memphis only became an administrative center under Aha. So yeah, the Memphis argument doesn't work either way, too. I believe the most convincing evidence the Narmer party has are two objects I'm about to discuss, and the overwhelming evidence suggesting Narmer completed the unification of Egypt by subduing the Chehenu living in the western Nile Delta, which is what I devoted most of my last video to discussing. The two objects I mentioned are seal impressions from two cylinder seals found at Abydos. One of them was found in the tomb of Den, the fifth pharaoh of the first dynasty, and one of them was found in the tomb of Ka'a, eighth pharaoh of the dynasty. The Den ceiling lists the Horus names of the first five kings of the first dynasty, starting with Narmer and ending with Den, followed by the name of Queen Merit Neith, who didn't get her own Horus name because she was only queen regent. The Ka'a seal shows all eight kings of the first dynasty, this time not including Merneith. This is the number of First Dynasty kings given by Manetho, in reverse order, from Ka'a back to Narmer. All of these kings were probably mentioned on these seals because they were included within the royal mortuary cult. All in all, these two seals clearly demonstrate that relatively shortly after his own time, Narmer was considered the founder of the First Dynasty and thus of a unified Egypt. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for my next Pharaoh's video on AHA. Goodbye.